Just 56 seconds, our ceremony will begin. If anyone is not by their seat, if you would kindly find your table at this time. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please rise as you turn your attention to center stage for the singing of the U.S. and Australian national anthems by Rachelle Durkin. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so bright The twilight's last gleaming With red stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight Of the ramparts we watched Was so gallantly swinging And the rocket's red glare still there oh say towards that star spangled banner yet wave oh the land of the free and the Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. With golden soil and wealth for toil, our home is girt by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare. In history's page, let every stage advance Australia fair. In joyful strains, then let us sing, advance Australia fair. Ladies and gentlemen, Rochelle Durkin. And now, if you would kindly be seated as we introduce our MC for tonight's gala. Currently based in New York, this Australian native is a charismatic entertainer and actress who has enjoyed success on stage, screen, and television. Please welcome your master of ceremonies, Amanda. Bishop. Thank you and good evening. 
On behalf of the American Australian Association Chairman Jennifer Nason and President John Berry, I would like to wish you a happy Australia Day for January the 26th and welcome you all to tonight's Australia Day Black, Gala, Black Tie Gala Dinner. We have a number of special guests from government who are joining us this evening that I'd like to acknowledge. The Honourable Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia and President of the Asia Society Pol Policy Institute. The Honourable Craig Laundie, Assistant Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, and the Honourable Nick Minchin, Consul General, New York. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to tonight's exceptionally talented honorees, Ben Lowy and Marita Cheng. Marita has joined us all the way from Melbourne, Australia. The gala is made possible with thanks to our presenting sponsor, National Australia Bank. My personal bank. <laughs> Along with sponsors Westfield, Pratt Industries, Arup, Austrade, Ben Scott, Business Events Sydney, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Dow, Jennifer Nason, News Corp, Qantas, Reserve Bank of Australia, Sydney Austin LLP, Tourism Australia and Westpac. Thank you. You'll also be enjoying delicious Australian Spanner Crab, lamb loin wine and beer, thanks to food and beverage sponsors, Thomas Foods International, Rockcliffe, Jance Tasmania, Mosswood Wines and Cooper's Beer. As part of tonight's program, we have a silent auction, which will be open until 10 p.m. tonight. This is important information. There are some amazing items to bid on, including two business class round trip airfares from New York to Australia, flying Qantas Airways. A day's sailing, exactly, at the 35th America's Cup J-Class Regatta in Bermuda this June aboard the luxury yacht Hanuman and much more. Please take a look at your dinner program for the silent auction flyer on your chairs for further information and descriptions about the many great items on offer. And for those of you who are thinking about a trip to Australia, I'm pleased to let you know that Qantas Airways has generously provided each of you here tonight with a special Australia Week coupon providing an additional 15% discount off sale fares. <laughs> the voice of God. So if you didn't get that last bit, that's a 15% discount off Qantas sale fares for everyone here tonight. Thank you, Qantas. You find the coupon details in your program journals. Prizes and bidding forms are displayed on the table to my far right, near the bar, for the silent auction. Funds raised from the silent auction support the American Australian Association and its Dame Jones Sutherland Fund, which assists aspiring Australian and American artists. So please, open your wallets and start some friendly bidding, be mindful that there's no second place, with your compatriots. Welcome to you all and thank you for joining us for this special evening. It is now my great honor to welcome to our stage the chair of the American Australian Association, Jennifer Nason. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the American Australian Association board, our fabulous president, John Berry, and his team. I wish you a very happy Australia Day a little ahead of time. While it is not the balmy beach or barbecue weather that Australians are typically used to for Australia Day, we are nonetheless delighted to bring the very best of Australia right here to you tonight in the Big Apple. Tonight's gala would not 
be possible without the continued support from American Australian Association board member and dear friend, Rich Rauschenberg and the National Australia Bank. A special thank you to Rich and to all of you here tonight. I'd also like to make mention of longtime association patron and G'day USA champion, Peter Lowy, a proud Australian and a tireless ambassador for Australia here in America and around the world. Peter is here tonight to support this wonderful evening and to celebrate the achievements of his youngest son, Ben. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage someone who really requires very little introduction, Australia's 26th Prime Minister, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, to provide the Australia Day message. On the eve of Australia Day, it is important to remember and recognise Prime Minister Rudd's contribution to Australia, many contributions to Australia, including his historic and healing formal apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples, <laughs> Prime Minister Rudd successfully steered Australia through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Prime Minister Rudd was also responsible for the appointment of Australia's first female Governor-General, Dame Quentin Bryce. And internationally, he courageously, at the time, ratified the Kyoto Protocol, increased Australia's troop commitment to fight alongside America in the war on terror, and he led the expansion of the East Asia Summit to include the United States. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Kevin Rudd. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, um, and uh, Ambassador John Berry, uh, Consul General uh, Nick Minchin, the Honourable Craig Laundie, who's here from Australia, representing the Turnbull government, distinguished guests, my fellow Australians, fellow New Yorkers, one and all. And I begin tonight by honouring, in fact, our first Australians, uh, who first settled our continent some 70,000 years ago, and whose cultures represent the oldest continuing cultures on Earth. I also honour those Australians who have come more recently to our land from every single country on God's earth, all equal members of our great Australian family. And I'd like to wish each and every one of you here this evening a terrific Australia Day, both now and through to the day itself. Uh, did any of you happen to come through the uh, demo outside tonight, by the way? Yeah. I didn't realize they all knew that Nick Minchin was here. So, so they told me it was all about you, Nick. There's another bloke in Washington they were less concerned about. The, um, it's great to be here at the Australia Day Gala. Are you sick and tired of going to galas? Gala, gala, or as we say in Queensland, gala. Uh, so where are you all from tonight? Uh, who's here from the great state of Queensland? You can see them all. Oh, the cultured crowd, oh, I'm one of them. Oh, there's a Yahoo there I can see. Anyone from the great state of New South Wales? Uh, we all have our problems. What about uh, the People's Republic of Victoria? You, you fixed the area yet? No. South Australia. Ah, oh, the super cultured crowd. Yeah, we know that. Basically, it's basically booze, isn't it, guys? Uh, sand gropers from the west. Vocal, concentrated, and a minority. <laughs> Taswija. Okay, good to see you, Tazzy. The territory, crocodile country. Okay, the crocs have been busy. The, um, 
ACT. Hey. The territory that shouldn't have been one. The, uh, now, in, ter in terms of uh, the, the rest of the room, given that it's Australia Day, I need to ask this question as well. How many of you come from convict families? Come on, you can own up. It's America. They have criminals here too. Okay, that's me as well. In fact, you know, when I became Prime Minister, the American Mormons walked in the door and said, we're going to do your family tree. I said, no need to do that. I know I've got a convict forebear, Thomas Rudd, Second Fleet. They came back a month later and said, no, you've got five convict forebears in your family tree, which, as you know, is a good preparation for politics. Uh, how many of you claim to be the descendants of free settlers? How many of you just don't know? That's pretty good. Do we have Indigenous Australians with us tonight? Good on ya. First Australians. You know, Australia would not have been settled had this mob, our friends of the United States, uh, failed in the Revolutionary War. They had the temerity to defeat the British Empire. As a result, what happened? Britain lost its jail down at Savannah in Georgia. What did the British have to do? Invent a new jail. QED, Australia. <laughs> now, had the Americans lost the Revolutionary War, all of you, including myself, who were of convict origin, would have, in fact, been sent to Georgia. Think about that. You could have all been down there voting 75% for Mr. Trump. Uh, and had I played my cards right, I could have ended up as governor of Georgia rather than prime minister of Australia. On this presidential inauguration day, we reflect on the past and the future of our two great democracies. Australia and America, while young countries, are among the world's oldest continuing democracies. We need to remind ourselves afresh that the democratic project is indeed a very recent project in history. It's also a very fragile project which we must continue to nurture. This is difficult in the challenging times in which we now all live, both here and around the world, in the democracies of the world. But the alternative, my friends, is too frightening to contemplate. Both in America and in Australia, we're proud of the fact that our liberties have been hard won. They should never be surrendered lightly, because there is nothing inevitable about democracy in the modern world. It can be destroyed much more rapidly than it has been created. Democracy's future will hinge on an active citizenry, or else it will wither and die as a result of the indifference from the many yielding to the extremism of the few. Which brings me to my next point. In this country, America, the election of President Trump has seen much division, and that division will continue. But the fact remains that under the constitutional conventions of this country and the role of the Electoral College, Mr. Trump is the democratically elected President of the United States and should be respected as such. We must all, therefore, seek to work constructively with him for the good of both our countries and the good of the world. Mr. Trump's presidency will be controversial both at home and abroad, but we in Australia must not allow division and controversy to diminish either our friendship or our alliance with the United States. Presidents and prime ministers come and go. I have some experience of that. <laughs> but the democratic values for which our two countries have fought and died form a much deeper and enduring bond between us. So I say to you, in the challenging years that lie ahead, we must continue to tender carefully the garden of this US-Australia relationship and this alliance and tender that relationship with much love and care. Finally, this brings me to each and every one of you, the Australians here present, who have the privilege of living and working here in America and you all have a critical role to play. Each and every one of you are ambassadors for Australia here, whether you like it or not. Extraordinarily, you have been extraordinary ambassadors. 
whatever field you are engaged in, whether it's the industries, the universities, the arts, the not-for-profits, the professions in which you represent, I hear stories each day in the two years I've lived in this city of the remarkable things that you are doing. I hear it from my American friends, from people like Andrew Liveris, who's been appointed by President Trump to head the National Manufacturing Council of this country, through to the young bloke I just met who came here as a young entrepreneur a few, a few years ago and has invented his own removable grip for a golf club. That's you. See, I've got a memory, mate. Mind you, he's a smart Australian. He got the table closest to the bar over there. <laughs> so that you rip it off and put it back onto your club, and it's always got your grip with it. Young entrepreneurs like that, great captains of industry like Liveris, and all of you in between. Because I'd say this as someone who's had some experience of political office. Your actions as individuals, your innovations as Australians abroad, your values each speak volumes for the country from which we all hail and the land that we love down under. So friends, on this 229th Australia Day, I would simply encourage all of you to continue to hold high the good name of Australia in all that you do and say and contribute here in America, because your voice is bigger than any of us who come from government or politics more broadly. And I ask you all to continue to be the human bridge that binds our two peoples, whatever the challenges our two nations may face in the troubled years ahead. And together, let us all advance Australia Fair together. I thank you. Our enormous thanks to the Honourable Mr. Kevin Rudd for joining us tonight. I thank him too for his reminder of our Australia Day being so inclusive for many of us. I'd also personally like to thank our fellow Americans for helping us host this evening. I would now like to invite the Honourable Craig Laundie, Assistant Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, and the member for Reid in New South Wales, to say a few words and introduce Marita Chang. We are grateful Mr. Laundy was able to take time out of his busy program on the US West Coast to join us tonight. Please welcome the Honorable Mr. Craig Laundy. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, John Berry, just as I, uh, as Kevin finished, John Berry, who I used to be able to go down the road and see, but now I have to travel a little further. John looked straight over and he said, no pressure. Always, uh, always nice to uh, follow a former prime minister, especially one as eloquent as uh, the Honourable Kevin Rudd. It's a lot easier. I wish actually Nick Minchin had gone before me because no, 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 not because he's not a good orator, but because I don't reckon you would have recognised him. He's rocked in tonight with a tie that's more outlandish than John Berry's, which is a feat in and of itself, and, uh, and sporting a beard, which he tells me, he assures me, is for the New York weather. Speaking of, uh, Jennifer, to you and your board, John, I know you're on the board, thank you so much for the invitation. Yes, Amanda, you're right, I have commuted over this afternoon from San Francisco, and I'll go back in the morning to go to their event like this tomorrow night. Uh, no one explained the geography of that when they asked me to do it. But for those of you that aren't Australian, before I make some and introduce an amazing young Australian to you, Kevin ran through state by state uh, asking where you're from. Now, you, you would have heard some laughs from those in other states from Australia, but hands up those that aren't from Australia. Are there many here? Yeah? All right. What I like to do, I'm from Western Sydney, so we talk very plainly. We don't use big words, and the reason we don't is because we don't know them. I wanted to decipher what you're sitting next to for the relevant people that you saw put up your hand. Firstly, for those of you sitting next to Queenslanders, 
in about an hour and a half, you've got a decision to make. <laughs> whether or not you move table or whether or not you try and hold them back from going to the bar. For those of you that are next to people from Adelaide, from South Australia, speak slowly <laughs> because they are a half an hour behind in 1973. For those of you from New South Wales, don't worry, you're in safe hands, I'm one of you. And for those of you that are sitting next to those from Melbourne, I can assure you that when you go outside late tonight, it's like a summer's day from where they're from. I'm delighted to be here to represent the Turnbull government this evening. Uh, in a moment, I'll be introducing to you one of the uh, two people the American Australia Association has seen fit to be an honoree this year. A young Australian whose achievements to date exemplify what the Australian government is setting out to embed through our innovation policy. But first, uh, I, it says in my speech here, this is the problem when you go off the cuff, it says extend your good wishes. I've already done that, so I can skip that part. I told you I'm from Western Sydney. Today is, of course, a significant day for the United States of America. I don't know, uh, given Kevin's explanation of the fact he could have ever been the governor of Savannah. I don't think his politics would have lined up. But it's exciting to be here uh, on such a momentous day. And I extend my congratulations to all our US colleagues in the room for the peaceful transition of power that we have seen today. Whether or not you agree with the politics, one thing you can't debate is that we, you live in a beacon of democracy and what we've seen today is something you should be very, very proud of. As many of you will know, the Australian government has a major focus on making Australia a leading innovation nation. Our national innovation and science agenda is the centrepiece of this, NISA 1. We're spending $1.1 billion to lay the foundations in NISA 1 of the Australian innovation policy. Already, many of the platforms of this policy are well advanced. In fact, uh, I've been over in San Francisco this week looking at the, uh, the landing pad, which we have launched over there. The landing pad, launch pad, call it what you want. It's one of either. But it, it's just fantastic to see these, these initiatives bearing fruit at such early times. One of the key elements in the National Innovation and Science Agenda and in getting to Marita this evening is STEM and, and STEM careers, opportunities for Australians in STEM. And we have several initiatives that are particularly focused on helping girls and young women to consider STEM careers. Yeah. As a father of two daughters, I'm right with you, yeah. And it's great that the American Australia Association has chosen a wonderful role model to be honoured this year in this particular field. Marita Cheng, who I have the honour tonight of sitting next to, has been a passionate advocate for years of the need to address gender disparity, not only in the STEM workforce, but also in higher education in its entirety. As an engineering student at the University of Melbourne, she was concerned by the low proportion of girls in her classes. In 2008, she and a peer founded RoboGals. I like it, gals. Using fellow students working in the schools to teach girls robotics and to encourage them into engineering careers. The following year, RoboGals, not happy enough in Melbourne, extended to London, while Marita was on an academic exchange at the Imperial College. Eight years later, RoboGals has taught robotic workshops to 50,000 girls in 11 countries. But wait, there's more. In addition, Marita is also a technology entrepreneur. She's the founder of Obot, oh, sorry, Owbot, which is working to make a difference for people with mobility difficulties through its telepresence robot, Teleport. And I don't want to give too much away, but you're about to see something shortly. 
Our bot is working on robotic arms for people with limited upper body mobility, virtual reality, and autonomous mapping and navigation applications. I said at the outset, I'm an enormous fan and I'm not alone. If I listed all her achievements, we'd be here all night. Suffice to say, Marita was the 2012 Young Australian of the Year, and Venture Beat magazine called her the, and I quote, coolest girl at CES 2014, which some of you will know as the great greatest gadget show on earth. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to all of you the American Chamber's first honoree this evening, Marita Cheng. Hi everyone, how's it going? Yeah, I don't really wear these dresses very often, so that's why I kind of tripped on the stairs on the way up. Heels, long dresses, I don't know how people handle that. So thank you for having me here tonight and giving me this award that I think, I think Craig was meant to give this to me. But he just left it on the leg turn, so I think I'll just take it home. It's got my name on it. So, as Craig mentioned, I've been working on building a robot for the past couple of years. It's called Teleport, and it's a telepresence robot. Does anyone know what a telepresence robot is? Can you raise your hand? Okay, I see that the Tasmanians know. Well done. So, a telepresence robot enables people to be in multiple places at the same time. So you could be here physically in New York and have a robot in Sydney, in Melbourne, Brisbane, in Hobart. And so even though you're living and working here, you can just pop on to your computer, log into a robot and drive it around, have meetings over there, uh, see people over there, uh, go to engagement parties, go to weddings, go to lots of events over there without actually taking the flight in order to get there. And so the other use cases, so the other use cases for it are like kids in hospital with cancer can go to school even while they're uh, getting treatment in hospital. People with uh, disabilities or in rehab can continue go to, going to work even while they're in hospital. Uh, CEOs, corporations, co-working spaces, they can have their staff collaborate more easily across the world uh, using these robots. So our robot's really cool. It can be as high as 1.7 meters tall. And so uh, people say, oh, my, well, my friends say that I only created it so that people who haven't met me yet think that I'm taller than I actually am, because I'm really short. And it can be lo as low as 1.1 meters tall, so it's really easy to throw away in the back of your car. So we started shipping these robots in November last year. And, um, and another thing that's really cool about our robot is that it's modular. So basically, you can take the head off our robot and put a new head on. And so that's why like, we're working on virtual reality, we're working on navigation, we're working on robot arms. It's because it's so easy to take our robot apart and give it new features. And so one of the new heads that we've been working on that we started prototyping last month is this one here. It's, uh, we've been working on giving it some social abilities so that it can have simple conversations with people in retail stores, or you can put it at your grandma's house and the robot can keep your grandma company by having simple conversations with it. So I've taken Sharon here to New York with me, and because Sharon comes from Australia, uh, we actually call her Shazza. And so the other use case. G'day all, I'm Shazza, how are you going? Yeah, not bad, not bad. So, um, yeah, how's it going, Shazza? Mate, it's grouse. It's been a beaut of a day. So, what have you been doing today, Shazza? I've been taking a squiz at the big smoke. Bloody oath. And uh, how are you finding the weather here, Shazza? Shazza? 
I gotta tell ya, it's bloody cold out there. My jump has been as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. So, do you have anything to say about the American Australian Association, Shazza? They're a bunch of real top blokes and sheilas. Dead set legends. Yeah, I think so too. So, um, they're serving some pretty good Australian food tonight. How, how are you finding the food? Shazza? Yeah, it was some bloody good tucker. But, if you ask me, just chuck some shrimp on the barbie and keep the VB coming. And did you hear about the open bar tonight, Shazza? Shazza? Fair dinkum, I'll be off my face quicker than a cut snake. So I've brought you all the way to the Big Apple, to New York City, in America. Um, I guess you're making the most of your time here, Shazza? I've had a ripper time, though, I gotta say. I'm looking forward to heading back to the lucky country. And what do you think about our teleport robot, Shazza? I reckon. I don't want to be a spooker, but it's marvellous. I can be out whoop whoop and still go a waltzing Matilda through Central Park. I'm glad you like it, but you know, we've actually been adding a whole lot of new features recently, Shazza. Stoked. What have you got for me? Well, we actually made our robot brain controlled, so you can see in this video here. I'm Anthony, I'm 36 years old. I had a character that went on six years old. I broke my spinal cord at the highest level. And I can still use my brain, I can still talk. So it might sound that I'm pretty incapacitated, but if you only, th if you only think of the good things, not too bad at all in all. And this bar down here is the attention, so the amount you're concentrating. Right. As long as you bring it over that threshold bit, yep. it's going to activate that load, it's going to move forward. So all you have to do is think, and once you get past that, the robot will move. So you just made the robot move with your brain. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> hey Chris. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So cool. There you go. I turned my head, well, I just turned the robot. That's well, I've never really got anything to move off my brain. So I was pretty unbelievable in that sense. I was on a big high actually achieving it. I didn't actually think I'd be able to do it. Okay, well that's all I've got, so see y'all. Marita Chang, everybody. Thank you, Marita. And thank you, Shazza. I, I'm just copping a feel. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage a very popular and much loved actor who has appeared in numerous Broadway musicals, including his performances as Simba in The Lion King and as Aaron Burr in Hamilton. Yes, from the original cast of the critically acclaimed multi-award winning and world-dominating show Hamilton, I now welcome Sydney James Harcourt to perform for you tonight. Please welcome Sydney.
evening. Uh, first, I'd like to say, I can't get you tickets. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, but uh, I would really like to thank the American Australian Association for having me here today. Interestingly, I was, a while ago, uh, an American cast member of the television program High Five, and I went to Sydney to uh, shoot it and then toured North America, so I kind of feel like an ambassador of sorts myself. So maybe I can be honored next year. <laughs> no? Move, on, move along? Okay. Um, the first song I'm going to sing for you tonight uh, is from a musical that was produced by Benjamin Lowy here in New York at City Center, starring Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Sunday in the Park with George. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to perform this song before. Uh, I did learn it for Mr. Stephen Sondheim. I was in final calls for his review, Sondheim on Sondheim. And I walked into the room and was ready and he said, anything but finishing the hat. So I put it away, and I sang Joanna from Sweeney Todd. And if you want to know how to put Stephen Sondheim right to sleep, sing Joanna from Sweeney Todd. So um, if you don't know the show, it concerns the painter George Surratt, uh, who ushered in the pointillism. And uh, this song is about how he juggles uh, his love for art and uh, romantic love, and it's called Finishing the Hat. Yes, she looks for me. Good. Let her look for me to tell me why she left me, as I always knew she would. I had thought she understood. They have never understood and no reason that they should. But if anybody could, finishing the hat, how you have to finish the hat, how you watch the rest of the world through a window while you finish the hat. Sky, what you feel like planning a sky, what you feel when voices that come through the window go until they distance and die, until there's nothing but sky, and how you're always turning back too late from the grass or the stick or the talk or the light, how the kind of to see it's the only way to see and when the woman that you wanted goes you can say to yourself well I give what I give but the woman that you wait for you knows that however you live there's a part of you always standing a hat Thank you Thank you uh, 
This next song is, um, is from an obscure musical uh, that most of you probably haven't seen um, uh, that I got to do off-Broadway uh, and then uh, later on Broadway. Uh, it's called Hamilton. Um, and, um, you know, well, let's be honest, most of you have not seen it. Um, uh, but at this, uh, at this point in the show where the song takes place, um, it's after Alexander Hamilton's wed uh, wedding to uh, Elizabeth Schuyler, and Aaron Burr is a guest at the wedding, and he tells Alex congratulations, and Alex brings up the rumor that he has heard that Aaron has a girl, and you know where is she? And um, it's true, uh, he does have a girlfriend. She is the wife of a British officer, and. Um, you know, Aaron Burr is very demure about his private life and about his life in general, whereas Alexander is just brash and go get him and, you know, sees the day. And he says, what are you waiting for? If you want this girl, go get her. And that's not Aaron Burr's philosophy. His philosophy was to wait that things would come to him. And at this point in the show, Alex leaves and he explains to the audience as the narrator his mantra for how he lives his life. Trying to keep the colonies alive. Well, he can keep all of Georgia. He told you she's mine. Love doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and takes and takes. And we can love it anyway. Laugh and cry and we break and we make mistakes. And if there's a reason, I'm by her side when so many have tried. And I'm willing to wait for it. I'm willing to wait for it. Father was a fire and brimstone preacher. There are things that the homilies and hymns won't teach her. My mother was a genius. My father commanded respect. When they died, they left no instructions, just a legacy to protect. Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and takes and takes and we can live in any way. Rise and fall, that we break and make mistakes. And if there's a reason, I'm still alive. When everyone who loves me has died, I'm willing to wait for it. I'm willing to wait for it. Wait for it. I am the one thing in life I can control. I am inimitable, I am an original. Standing still, I am lying in wait. Hamilton faces an endless uphill climb. He has something to prove, he has nothing to lose. Hamilton's pace is relentless, he wastes no time. no restraint. He takes and he takes and he takes and he keeps winning anyway. Changes the game, plays and he raises the stakes and if there's a reason he seems to thrive when so few survive. But God damn it, I'm willing to wait for it. I'm willing to wait for it. Life doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes.
Thank you. So, um, finally, uh, I was asked to sing a, a song, uh, non-musical theater of my choice, and uh, I decided to sing the song that got me the job at Hamilton um, for my initial audition in the workshop. Um, it's a song that I think we can all always hear, but we can relate to, especially on this fateful day. We've got, you know, a road ahead of us, and I just think it's important to take it slow and see what happens and uh, be present and watch and listen. Uh, it's called Ordinary People. It's by the great John Legend, and I'm happy to sing it for you. This ain't the honeymoon, we pass the infatuation phase. Right in the thick of love, times we get sick of love, it seems like we argue every day. I know I misbehave, and you make your mistakes, and we both still got room left to grow. Though love sometimes hurts, I still put you first. This ain't a movie, no, no fairy tale conclusion, no. It gets more confusing every day. Oh, sometimes it's heaven sent, and you head back to heaven again. Kiss and you make them on the way. I hang up, you call, we rise and we fall, and we feel like just walking away. As our love advances, we take. Chances. No, it's not fantasy. I still want you to stay. We're just ordinary people. We don't know which way to go. Cause we're ordinary people. Maybe we should take it slow. Take it slow. This time we'll take
Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, I'd like to say a, a few words about our next honoree, Benjamin Lowy. Uh, uh, I think musical theater in New York at this time is coming out of a period, uh, sort of, of a time capsule. Um, that's been its, I think, problem for a while. It's not been on the cutting edge of entertainment. It's been sort of viewed as a throwback. And uh, Benjamin is a breath of fresh air to the community. He's bringing uh, new audiences, younger audiences. It's more inclusive. Uh, he champions new ways of storytelling, new stories to be told, and production elements that probably aren't generally considered stage-worthy in theater. Um, and he's part of that new guard, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how he changes the scape of theater in the years to come. On a personal note, um, he, unlike most producers, is kind and, um, <laughs> and generous. And, uh, and he is funny and humorous. He's trustworthy. And uh, he's somebody you want standing by your side. He's best kind of friend. I'm honored to call him my friend. So without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage, Benjamin Lowy. Ben and Marita. I'm John Berry, the president of the AAA Association, and I just want to tell you a little bit about the award that we're presenting to both Marita and Ben tonight. We're looking to honor the next generation, and sometimes to do that, it's good to go back to where you began. And we couldn't think of a better place to start than Eleanor Roosevelt, who at the height of World War II, 1943, at a time when neither Australia nor America were in charge of the Pacific, traveled to Australia to open the new American embassy there. She lost 35 pounds on the journey. She toured and visited over a half a million servicemen in 18 different locations through the Pacific. But in Canberra, in opening the embassy, she planted two oak trees. She did it as a symbol that not only would the United States and Australia win the war together, but that they would shape the peace after the war, and in fact, the remainder of the 20th century. We could not think of a better legacy than to present the award than planting an oak tree in honor of both Ben and Marita. And the award tonight will be an award that will continue to grow and flourish as each of your careers, we are certain, will do. Thank you for your leadership already. Thank you for what you will yet do. And God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And I just want to uh, especially thank my friend Sydney Harcourt for that amazing, amazing performance. Thank you so much, Sydney. Uh, it's an absolute honor for me to be up here today, and I'm humbled to be sharing the night with Marita Chang, whose groundbreaking work in robotics and technology sets an example for young people worldwide showing that the only barrier to innovation is one's imagination. And I want to thank Shaz as well, who's <laughs> up with me tonight. She could have written the speech for me, but I had to do it myself. <laughs> it means a lot for me to be joined this evening by my parents, Janine and Peter, and some of my closest friends. In fact, my dad was honored by the American Aust Australian Association a few years back. So the pressure is on tonight, as I have some pretty big shoes to fill. 
Two years ago, I started the Lowy Saltpeter Company with the goal of developing, producing, and supporting theatrical works destined for the stage and beyond. Together with my producing partner, Adrian Saltpeter, we have curated a diverse body of work and are embracing our roles as the next generation of leaders in our field. Among our proudest achievements in 2016 was co-producing My Fair Lady at the Sydney Opera House. Julie Andrews returned to direct the show that started her career 60 years ago. We were thrilled to join this production and we are bringing it to audiences throughout Australia in 2017. All involved were delighted to see the show connect deeply with uh, Sydney audiences and it became the highest grossing show in opera house history. One, thank you. Very exciting. One of the major achievements of this production of My Fair Lady was that the cast was entirely Australian. It is no secret that creative talent uh, abounds in Australia, and My Fair Lady reminds us at LSC to explore the untapped talent throughout the continent. To this end, we are in active dialogue with a number of organizations in bringing these new Australian talents to New York City. Admittedly, I was unsure that a classic revival of a Golden Age musical would connect with contemporary Australian audiences, but I underestimated the relevance of good storytelling. The shared experience of sitting together in a dark room for a few hours without distraction underscores the power of the theater to inform, engage, and entertain. Art has the power to stimulate conversation and facilitate understanding of experiences outside of one's own. I was particularly struck by the success of the Broadway production of The Humans, a play which Adrian and I invested in last year. The Humans tells the story of working class parents from Pennsylvania uh, and their adult children living in New York City. The play delicately but forcefully represents how economic, social, class, and political policies and distinctions affect everyday people. The play, which went on to win four Tony Awards and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, connected with audiences because it made one's family reality universal. This is the responsibility of good theater makers. Now, more than ever, there is the need to support work that challenges audiences and creates dialogue around sometimes difficult topics. At LSC, this challenge has informed our slate of projects for 2017, which include Sondheim Sunday in the Park with George, Lynn Nottage's Sweat, Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie, Lucas Nath's A Doll's House Part Two, and Paula Vogel's Indecent. Sunday in the Park, the story of a struggling artist to connect with the world around him. Sweat, which takes place on the eve of President Obama's election, is about a rural Pennsylvania manufacturing town devastated by factory closures, factory closures and job loss. The Glass Menagerie, the venerable classic is being reimagined and uh, is being reimagined and for the first time a differently abled actress will be playing the role of Laura Wingfield. A Doll's House Part Two, a new American play continuing the story of a 19th century housewife who after leaving her husband and children returns home years later to demand a divorce from her husband and indecent the true story of the American premiere of a European Yiddish play featuring a lesbian love story. These projects, while diverse in story, character, and tone, all speak to contemporary issues affecting everyday people. During World War II, Winston Churchill refused to cut arts funding, saying, after all, that's what we are fighting for. Now, in 2017, our new administration plans to indefinitely close the National Endowment for the Arts. This means that more than ever, theater must exist to challenge audiences, offer new perspectives, and expand the human experience. This is the power of theater, and I encourage you to find me tonight this evening to discuss how theater has moved you and how you can get involved in the movement to support art. Thank you so much to the American Australian Association for having me, and have a great night. Ben Lowy, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the president, John Berry. 
Um, I'd like to also uh, make a special thank you to Sydney James Harcourt for that delicious singing. Uh, even Shazza enjoyed it. You noticed she was spinning her head. <laughs> And also harking back to the gorgeous Rochelle Durkin for the anthems earlier tonight. A cappella, everybody. Yes. It's the correct technical term for singing unaccompanied. It also means you can pick any key you want. But on a more technical note, it's actually more difficult. And with opera singing, clearly any key is no problem. Okay, dinner is about to be served and there's nothing like the smell of food to make your tummies rumble. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to go to the silent auction, please bear with me while I list very, very briefly the prizes that you will be bidding for so that you can support people like Marita and Ben. Here we go, I'm gonna get them over in 30 seconds. Uh, of course, we've got the two round trip business class tickets from New York to Sydney through Qantas Airways, the Spirit of Australia. You can spend a day sailing at the 35th America's Cup J-Class Regatta in Bermuda this June aboard the award-winning luxury lot yacht Hanneman, helmed by the two-time US Rolex Yachtsman of the Year, Ken Reed. A made-to-measure suit from P. Johnson Taylors. Custom made, stay with me ladies and gentlemen, we're almost finished. R.M. Williams bespoke boots. A tropical crinkle dress from Zimmerman's Resort Swim 17 collection. Membership to the Manhattan Cricket Club, which is a luxury cocktail den. These are really groovy prizes. This is quite astounding. A custom made luxury leather dog jacket from Wolfpack, my favorite. One night's accommodation and dinner at the two for two at the Paul Hotel. Two portrait package options from Bradford Renaissance. A sunset in the city print renowned by renowned Australian artist Virginia Cuppage, an Australian seascape painting by Jacinta Stewart, and dinner for four at Cipriana Restaurant 55. Good luck. Bidding sheets are on my right. We're also going to play for you tonight while you enjoy your meals. Music by James Willis, performing for you tonight as DJ Jamo Willow. Enjoy. <laughs> 